Well, we finally did it. We convinced Mr. Ken McDermott to sit down and do an interview with me. So sit back and enjoy, Ken. It's going to be great. Hi, everybody. Will here with this week's interview chair, and we finally did it. We finally got Mr. Ken McDermott to agree to an interview. How are you, Ken? I'm very good, Will. I'm always good to be in your company. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate. I appreciate seeing you as well. <laughs> thank you. And you. And how how's your winter been so far? It's been a non-winter. It's been a most unusual thing. You know, I'm I'm in my 82nd year. And winters like this are unknown. Certainly didn't have them when I was a kid. 82nd. You should probably come and hang out with Mrs. Whitney. You guys are the same age. Uh, that could well be. Oh, I yeah, was born in 41. I'll check with Elaine, your mother. And I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure she's 82 now as well. Well, you can come out and hang up here. We have lots of snow, Ken. Lots. Of, it's still snowing. It's been snowing for th three days now. You're welcome to it, really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's begin. Tell me how you first got started in the sport of dogs, and tell me how old you were when you first got started as well. Hmm. I got, you know, I grew up in Newburgh, in the city of Newburgh, and we lived on the second story of a three-story building. My family was not dog-oriented. Uh, my cousins had a cocker spaniel named Spunky, and I always enjoyed spending time with Spunky. He wasn't nasty, thank you, God, but he was Spunky. My sister, much older than I, and brother-in-law, and my sister was 19 years older than me. Wow. They were stationed in Stuttgart, Germany, because he was with a special unit of the Army Air Force. And at the end of the Second World War, they were cleaning up what was left of Hitler's SS, and that was his job. He had a very interesting position. Wow. When they came back from Germany, they brought two dogs with them, both boxers, a dog called Cleo von der Neuenhalter, who was the son of Sigurd von Dohm, who Marion Breed imported into the United States in California. And they brought a bitch called... Uh, Asta von Dohm from the von Dohm Kennels in Munich, which was world famous for boxers. So I was exposed to dogs as a youngster, but I didn't have one. Um, if there was a dog loose anywhere near me, I brought it into the yard and I played with it all day. And then at dinner time, my mother would say, you know, you have to let that dog go home. And I would open up the gate and the dog would be allowed to go home. I had no idea where it came from or who owned it, but I enjoyed it. I just, I had a relationship, and I'm not sure how to explain that, with dogs. They trusted me. That was what it was. I can see that. Yeah. So that was my early exposure to dogs. When I was 15 years old, the veterinary, oh, my parents both died when I was young. My mother died when I was 11, and 18 months later, my father died. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear both that. died of cancer. Two weeks after my father died, his father, my grandfather died. So I had a lot of um, abandonment young. Didn't know about it. Didn't know that it would affect anything either. But I always had a relationship with dogs. When I was 15, the local veterinarian was looking for somebody to work at his kennel. What I had been doing earlier than that was caddying at a golf course. It wasn't all that fun. But working for a vet, that appealed to me. I went to work for them, and they had dog magazines. And whenever I had a break, I could sit and look at these dog magazines. Well, I didn't know that there were so many breeds, nor such magnificent dogs. Really? Oh, my goodness. 
Oh, my goodness. One of the early pictures that I remember is Annie with champion Tedwin's top billing. And I thought, oh, my God, I didn't know a poodle could look like that. Well, my job at the kennel was to clean the kennel. I also got to bathe dogs and cats occasionally. Never enjoyed bathing a cat because they did not like <laughs> <You> it. <know. laughs> and I learned how to trim dogs, uh, which was rather interesting. The, the wife of the veterinarian was into the trimming, and she was very good at it. She was a very smart girl about balance and blending of coats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I got to see that. <clears throat> I do realize that early on, there was a Welsh terrier that came in named Taffy. And I thought she was beautiful. She was one of the most beautiful things I had ever seen because she had a balance. She had an attitude. She was a terrier, but she was sweet. And, you know, she was a Welsh bitch. But she let you know she was a terrier. Years later, I found out that she came from one of the greatest Welsh Terrier kennels in North America, and that Seth Campbell had placed this bitch in this house. Little did I know. When I was uh, working for the vet, I started dating a young girl who had many interesting attributes. She had a Triumph convertible that we drove around in. And you're in <laughs> high school with that early high school? Yeah. You are somebody. She also had, had some other things. She had a Cocker Spaniel, a mere pet, a Beagle. You could tell it was that, but you couldn't tell much more about it. It wasn't very good. She had a miniature Schnauzer that she got from Fillmore Kennels, which belonged to Peggy Ansbach. It was a well-known miniature Schnauzer kennel. And she also had an Irish setter, Mackenzie Claudia who was basically red barn breeding. Well, this girl, her name was Nadine Barden. She had Italian blood. She wasn't too tall. The Irish setter was too much for her. So she says to me one day, you know, you like the dogs. And I said, I love the dogs. Little did she know it was part of the reason I was dating her. She had a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Although she was an attractive girl and a sweet person. She said to me, why don't you come to the house? I want to show you how to show the dog, and I have a reason. So I went to the house. She showed me how to groom it. She showed me how to gate it. She showed me how to set it up. And she said, what are you doing this weekend? I didn't have anything going on. Well, we got in her aunt's van, and we drove to Poughkeepsie, which is 20 miles away. The Mid-Hudson Kennel Club they were called at the time, the now called Kennel Association, was putting on a match show. And Joe Stetson, who was the dog editor of Field and Stream magazine, was the judge. So here we are at a dog show, a match show. But well, Will, in those days, match shows had good size entries. We didn't have lots of point shows, but we had a fair number of match shows. So we go there, and I show the Irish setter, and I w wind up winning the breed and setters among a few, and she compliments me on the wonderful job that I did. And then I went second in the group to a lab. The lab looked nice, and I wasn't sure whether my setter was better or equal. I had no idea, but I did enjoy showing it. So she was so happy, she says, next weekend, we've got another show. Really? And we went to Middletown, I think. We went to another show. And I repeated, same thing, second in the group. There came a third weekend and a third show, which was held in Newburgh. No kidding. It's held in the armory. Good-sized build, building. Good-sized match show. I went there, won Irish setters, and placed in the group again, I think second or third. As we walked out of the ring, there was a, a man, not very big stature, leaning against the wall. He looked a little bit like my father. My father was not a big man. Um, and Nadine introduced me to this man. She said, I want you to meet this fellow. So we shook hands, and he said his name was Seth Campbell. And he said to me, I've been watching you. He said, you have beautiful hands on a dog. I had no idea what he meant, Will. 
I knew that the dogs and I got along just by a touch. That's a gift that somehow you're given. You can't earn that. It's true. Yeah. It is given. You'd be taught that. Yeah. And uh, he said to me, I wonder if you'd like to work with me. Well, I didn't know what that meant, but that opened the world to me. Literally opened the world to me. Seth was one of the best known terrier men in the country. And terriers had my heart from early on. It was their character. It was their independence. It was them being themselves, and they didn't care about anybody else. They were themselves. And I guess that's what Ken McDermott wanted to be, just be himself. And I tell people that I'm a loner, but being a loner, God bless my wife, she said, you know, you could be the last person on earth and you'd be okay. I can make it look that way, but it isn't okay. Right. I really need to shake a hand. I really need to give and get a hug. I really need to see your eyes and your face. Yeah, I need that. When this COVID came along, boy, what a lesson. When we were separated from one another, I was earning, really yearning for that uh, presence. So it became obvious to me that uh, I'm not a loner. At any rate, time went on with Seth. He had a How nice- How old were you at that point, Ken? When I met Seth, 15, 16, he took me to my first Montgomery County in 62, it could have been 61. And we were at the G. Harrison Frazier Estate. We arrived early in the morning. There were puddles in the field that we had to drive across to get to where we needed to park. And those puddles were frozen. It was an October morning, of course, that's when Montgomery County was. And around the veranda, there were donuts and coffee for people, and there were gifts of little crystal ashtrays, basically, with silver rims that had MCKC stamped in them. I still have a couple. Those were just gifts for exhibiting there. That's crazy. And Seth had some interesting dogs with him. One of the primary ones was a, an Irish terrier champion wahoo satellite who i think he was the only irish that had won a best in the show at that time, that year it was very infrequent for irish to win he was a real stallion of a dog he was the kind of dog when when he went into the ring he looked at the competition and he knew them and he and he never left the ground though he didn't fly through the air trying to grab them. He stood his ground like, I own the ring, and I'm not sure why you're here. And I think that's the way an Irish should act. We called him champ. Certainly was. So Seth uh, had lots of good dogs over time that I got to see, I got to be with, I got to learn about, I got to assist with. And... Um, that was quite a beginning. Where did we go from there? Yeah, where we went from <laughs> there was um, Seth uh, had a client who had Kerry Blues. The Aaron Blue Kennels were located in Lomister, Massachusetts. It was Mr. Arthur Hillary, who owned an outdoor advertising company, and he had a fair number of Kerrys and some very nice ones. So at Seth's kennel, we had a number of carries, and he said to me one day, Mr. Hillary has a young carry he'd like to give you so that you can have one on your own. You can uh, condition it, you can trim it, you can live with it, and you can show it. And uh, I got this young dog that I called Rory. Aaron Blue Sianport was his name. All these names you remember. My God. <laughs> oh, I do. Yeah, I do remember that. And uh, he was a nice dog. He had wonderful temperament. He had very good balance. He had beautiful coat, nice headpiece, very decent mover. His mouth started to get a little bit funny. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't going to show a dog with a mouth that was questionable. I just wouldn't do it. So I found a good home with some people who lived in the next town down. They had two young sons, and they really enjoyed the dog. dog lived to be like 16, which carries do. I found out that terriers and terrier people are slow to go to ground. 
They often have long lives. I don't know why, but I, I found it over the years to be true. So in a short period of time, uh, Seth, he also had a wire client, Mrs. Monroe W. Lanier. <clears throat> and uh, she had a wire bitch that she thought I might be interested in called Mona Stella, My Fair Lady. She was an all white bitch with a tan head with a little split of white down the skull. Lovely bitch, beautiful side, beautiful coat, beautiful balance. And I loved her lady we called her she was by m price sensational at a champion wire text wins gillian uh beautiful breeding on this pitch and um i had her showed her enjoyed her uh when i was dating my wife this wire was always with me always because if my wife my future wife didn't approve of the dog she wasn't going to be with me because you know dogs were part of it part of the deal. So that was an early beginning, and I bred her to a dog that Mrs. Lanier bought, um, Kirkmore Coachman. Kirkmore Coachman and his daughter, champion Kirkmore Cockleshell, had been shown by Ricky, and another dog, a stallion of a dog, good-sized dog, and his name escapes me. Oh, no. <laughs> we wound up never showing him, so I guess that's why his name never stuck. But Coachman was alleged to have sired Cockleshell, although it was, he never sired anything else that looked quite like that, so it was questionable. <clears throat> I bred the bitch to him, and I got a very nice litter of dogs who were what I think a wire, wire should be. I usually sold them and didn't. I was not really a breeder. I wasn't. Uh, in our peregrinations, I said to Seth, will you ever judge? And he said, no. Now I'm talking about the early 60s. And I said, why? He said, to, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe you want to delete this part. He said, because if I was judging, if I didn't put up what they wanted, I would never be invited to judge again. It's hard to believe that that was ever true. But he yeah. knew that it was possibly true. I didn't believe We hear that. that. We still hear that. So it's not yeah. uncommon. So. It depends on how you are and how you act and how independent you really are. Yeah, I agree. So I really wasn't interested in being a breeder. I owned the wires. I owned the carry. And I owned Brussels Griffons for over 30 years. In fact, I was the first Eastern director of the National Brussels Griffon Club. Um, most people don't know that. No. Some people have an idea that I had some connection with Griff's. Well, I had them. I had Winner's Dog and Winner's Bitch at Nationals. Never won a National. Um, time went on, and uh, Seth died. I, I married in, I went to work at IBM in 62. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, so one day I went home from work. I had an apartment in Poughkeepsie with a lovely couple who owned a, a, a child's clothes store. And they, they never had children, but they were really a lovely couple. And I had the upstairs in their house. And I got home one day in 62, and the lady said to me, uh, you have a phone call today. I said, really? She's from a lady named Ann Hone Rogers. She'd like you to give her a call. And I thought, oh, my God. Well, I know who that is. That's Annie, the Annie, early on, mind you. Mm -hmm. This is 62. So I called Annie, and I said, hi, how are you? It's Ken. Yes. Well, I'm very interested to talk to you. I said, about? She said, I need help. I need help. And I've seen you at shows with Seth. And she repeated what he said. She used the same words. She said, I love your hands on a dog. Again, I knew what she meant, but I didn't know how to. I didn't know that it was observable. Mm -hmm. And she said, I wonder if you're interested to come to work for me. And I said, Annie, I just started working for IBM in February. I just got engaged. I can't walk away from that right now. And I couldn't, you know, 
dog shows and I wasn't sure how I could make a living at it or how it would work or how it would be working for her in Mayapac, which wasn't far away. But that started a, a lifetime of friendship with a woman who was infinitely brill brilliant as far as I was concerned about dogs. I loved her very much and she knew that. And I told her I'd never give away her secret. And I didn't. She was a bit shy. <laughs> no one saw that. At any rate. So time went on. Seth at a dog show one day had uh, a pain in his head. And he went and he laid down. He was married to Roberta by then. Uh, he didn't want to go to a doctor. He wound up getting home, and on Wednesday they went to the doctor, and they found out that he had a massive aneurysm. They operated on him, and um, he lived through the surgery, and the doctor said, I'm not sure what he'll be like after this. Uh, within two or three days, he died, which was actually the best thing for Seth. For him to be less than he was yeah. would not have been acceptable to Seth. So that was a great loss. You know, I loved the man. He was he was like a father figure. He also was the person who introduced me to terrier people who were worth knowing. And some others as well. <laughs> 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 but it was because of him that I got involved where I wanted to be involved. Terriers. I just loved terriers. And I wanted to judge. So I wound up I wound up showing dogs for people. I was never a handler. I had a small kennel. I did some boarding and I did keep up some of the dogs that I showed for other people. Not much. Not much. Most of my stuff was you bring me the dog, I'll I'll take care of it and get it ready and I'll show it. And here you take it back home. That's the way it was. And I showed 47 different breeds, which most people don't know. Mm -hmm. Covering all the groups. I showed a number of poodles too, which people don't know. I never showed a toy because back when I was showing, toy poodles to me looked like frogs. They had broad skulls and broad <laughs> forefaces, and they weren't pretty. They weren't pretty. <laughs> and I wouldn't show one. I just couldn't expose a judge to that and think that he was good enough. Nice. <laughs> So I showed some nice minis, and I showed some nice standards, <laughs> and uh, nothing shocking, nothing that anybody would ever remember, but I did, and it was fun. It was fun. But in my mind was always, I think I'd like to judge. I'm not sure how this happens, and I got into learning how it happens and keep good records, etc. And in 1977, I made an appointment with Glenn Brumby, Jr., who was executive vice president of the Kennel Club at the time. He had been a handler, and I knew him as a handler, too, because he lived on Long Island, where the Brumbies lived. <clears throat> so I went down and talked to Len, and I had the stuff written down, and we chatted, and he said to me, what is it you hope to do? And I slid him a list, I think of 12 breeds. And he took the list of 12 breeds, and he started crossing things off, and he slid it back to me. And he said, this is what I'll give you, Fox Terriers, Lakelands, and Welsh. And he said, what's your ultimate goal? I said, to judge the Terrier group. I said, if I ever get to the point where I judge the Terrier group, I've reached heaven. He said to me, if everything goes well, you'll have the Terrier group in 10 years. That was acceptable. I thought that was fine. Yeah. So time went on. It got published that I was licensed to judge Fox Terriers, Lakelands, and Welsh. The first club that hired me was the local club, Walk Hill Kennel Club, and I judged their show. And I had a major in smooths. I had a modest number of wires. I had uh, some Welsh, but no Lakelands, of course. There's the one a lot of Lakelands around. The wire that won the breed was shown by Cliff Hallmark, and it actually went on and won Best in Show, and it was top dog in the country at the time. Pretty easy to do that breed. 
<laughs> but Janie brought me a bunch of smooths, and she didn't win anything. And as she was leaving, she said to me, it's okay. And she said, I'll be back. I thought that was an endorsement. She was saying, you yeah. know, it's okay, you know. Um, and time passed, and she came, and she showed, and she won, and she lost. Time went on, and people started hiring me, which surprised me. It kind of did. I mean, a kid who grew up in New grew up in Newburgh, who thought that he would literally be invited to go around the world? Who whoever thought of that? I never did. Never. I don't know what I thought was going to happen. But the terrier group that I was going to get in 10 years of things went well. I got in three years and three months. And the toy group, I got in one fell swoop. And then I went 18 and a half years and I applied for nothing. And the lady who became now Mrs. Clark and I had a dinner one evening and she took her crooked finger, long as it was, pointed it at me and said, why aren't you judging more breeds? I said, well, I haven't applied for any more. She said, aren't there other breeds that you would want to judge? I said, there are any, but I just hadn't thought about doing it. I'm happy with doing my terriers and toys. She said, no, you should be judging more breeds. I want you to look into this. So with her urging, I did apply for another, a good size package, 15 maybe breeds. And they, they were just a couple of this and a couple of this and a couple of this, not dedicated toward going, toward getting a group. Because I was one of those who believed that you should know the breeds before you move on. Obviously, I went 18 and a half years without applying for anything, and I was being successful. So I applied, and I got them. And I finished them, and I let time go on, and I applied one more time. Uh, I only ever finished the, the two groups, the Terriers and Toys, uh, but I had dogs in every breed, every group, rather, except sporting, which is curious. Yeah, here, I set her background, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> First dog I ever showed was an Irish setter, and I never applied for sporting dogs. I didn't have a lot of exposure to them. I live in an area where uh, Melantine's My Own Brucey lived up the river, and My Own Brucey did a lot of winning, and he threw down his temperament on a lot of cockers, and many of them tried to bite me. No. I didn't want to be exposed to that. I thought, I don't want to be bothered with that. So the sporting breeds, pretty as they were, and I've given many best in shows, just not a group I knew that I didn't know enough to judge. Dr. Mike Woods, who's a good friend from Newfoundland, said to me, you should be judging my breed, Labradors. I said, good, you give me a personal license and I'll just judge at your place. <laughs> He's a great Labrador judge. I would have you would have, yeah, he, if he thought that you probably should have. <laughs> well, at any rate, time went on, and I I got invited to places that were impossible. You know, I judged in forty two states. My first away assignment was Enid, Oklahoma, and uh, Joan and I flew there. Uh, arrived at Oklahoma City. I was bird watching, of course. So I had my binoculars in the rental car and I drove around the outside of the airport picking up things like painted bunting, a species that we don't get. It was there singing. And I had another one too, Dick Sizzle. It's another, it's kind of a Midwest uh, sparrow. And one was singing. And I picked it up by its voice. So driving up to Enid, Oklahoma was wonderful. Uh, oh, no. Actually, when I landed at the airport, Pat Cruz was the AKC rep. She met us at the airport. She said, this is a big deal. I said, the total terrier entry was under 100. I said, this is a big deal. She said, yeah, for them in Oklahoma to get this size terrier injury is an endorsement of you. What are you talking about? I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're I'm <killing> just kidding. <laughs> there was a Scotty that was doing a lot of winning out of Texas in the area, and I knew that it existed. <laughs> and uh, interesting how things, when you finally see them, Quite what you were thinking that they were. 
but there was a miniature schnauzer open dog that I carried through to the breed in schnauzers. And um, he won the group under me. He belonged to Sue. Wow. Uh Uh-oh. Looking at the dog, I can still see the dog. Beautiful coat, beautiful balance, proper neck and shoulder. Gene Heath's uh, partner, Sue. Anyway, that's who she is. And uh, <laughs> it'll, it'll Barn- come back to you and you'll call me. <laughs> Barnstormer was the dog's name. And I, he wound up winning the group under me. And he went on, went on and did some other very nice winning. So that was my first away assignment, which was a surprise to a kid from Newburgh. And then the other things came. I ultimately judged in England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Mexico, every Canadian province that touches the contiguous states. I was invited to many, many, many other places, many that I wouldn't go to. I was, for my reasons, I was invited to Australia, and I was really interested. I was going to be going for a month. I was going to be judging in Australia, and then I was going to go to New Zealand and also judge. And then I went to the travel agent and the travel agent said, you leave at this hour on this day and you will arrive at this hour on this day. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, you're in the air for it was like I'm in the air for a week. (laughs) (laughs) It scares me, too. And I said, oh, no. And she said, oh, yeah. And I said, oh, no, I'm not going. So I uh, went home and I called the people who were kind enough to invite me and said to them, I'm very, very sorry, but I really can't be on the plane that long. I mean, I just can't imagine it. I really honestly can't imagine it. So God bless those who do. And uh, those who have done it have said to me, you would love it and you would love the birds. And I'd I'd love to see Jeannie Monford there. She's forever showing me pictures of the birds that she has in her yard. Not just too far. If the con- I said if the continental drift accelerates, or if the Concorde had ever flown <laughs> to Australia, I would get on it. She said to me, if the Concorde, the person in Australia said to me, if the Concorde ever flew here again, we would pay for you to get on it. I said, well, that was very kind. That was very kind. So... <laughs> so tell me some of your most favorite assignments then ken because i know you've judged everyone. my most favorite of course always will be montgomery county montgomery. and um in october of 2017 when i did the lakeland national there it was my fourth time doing lakeland national the president of the club said to me, do you know that no one else has ever judged a Lakeland National twice? And I said to him, I better get it right this time, eh? <laughs> that, of course was, <laughs> you did. that was my 33rd time judging at Montgomery County. I remember one year pulling in and having my thing for judges parking. And the person there said, well, just seeing your face, we should just send you to judges parking because you're judging here every year for some reason. That was that was that was a great honor always. Well, I mean, sure. Terriers, that's my group. That's in case you don't know. Years <laughs> ago, I said, if you call me a dog man, I'm honored. If you call me a terrier man, I'm elated. That's the highest honor that you could bestow on me really so i never said it but they considered me worth having the breed clubs that's who hired you it wasn't dr dubler who wasn't any of the officials it was the breed clubs that hired you for montgomery county great 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 show i did get to judge westminster who's also and i love that how can you not it's so impressive the unfortunate, well, yeah, it's in New York City, which is a problem for me. I live 63 miles north of it, and I don't go and visit it unless there's a real reason. But going there to judge the dog shows 13 times, 
That was a real reason. And when I was invited the first time, I said to Jack Marvin, who I'd come to know over the years, and who was like a like an uncle to me. He was a wonderful, wonderful man, a great author of terrier books. And um, he said to me, make sure you're at the dinner. And I said, well, I, I didn't know whether I was going to the dinner. He said, no, you're going to the dinner. I said, well, Mr. Marvin, I'll, I'll be uncomfortable at the dinner. He said, no, you'll be comfortable. He said, those people invited you because they want to see you. They want to talk to you. They've heard of you, but they don't know who you are, and they want to see you. It's impressive. My first time, and we were at, um, like, Central Park West at the Union Club, a private club. You went in, they showed you where to go to have your coat taken care of, and then they pointed to an elevator. I went on an elevator up to where they told me to get off. The door opened up and there was a man standing there and he said, welcome to Westminster, Bill Rockefeller, William A. Rockefeller, Jr. <laughs> Called himself Bill Rockefeller to a kid from Newburgh. <laughs> really? And I had oysters Rockefeller with Rockefeller. <laughs> and he, I, I admired his tuxedo. And the boutonniere, uh, the um, around his waist had had a Westie, and I said, "Well, I'm surprised." He said, "Oh, you're looking for the Bedlington?" Yeah, I said, "Where's that?" And he showed me. It was a little to the side. There was a Bedlington on it. On site, they're lovely people, and it was very, very nice. And wow. Jack Marvin was there. Mister Marvin, uh, Judge Westminster, fourteen times. He had told me, "Great man, great man." Well, wow. yeah. So Westminster was certainly, and a surprise. When you get an invitation to judge at Westminster, you get it 22 months before the show. I pulled up to my mailbox, and uh, I took the mail and didn't look at it, and I handed it to my wife, and she looked at it, and she said, oh, Westminster Kennel Club. I said, wow, maybe they want me to steward. This is early on in my judging, early on. Like, I started judging in 78. This was 1980. It was in 80. It would have been or 81. She opened it up and she said, oh, no, they want you to judge. They want you to judge. And she told me what they wanted me to judge. Irish and Kerry's and soft-coated Wheaton's. Well, who thought of that? <laughs> Having the Irish kid judge the three breeds that come from Ireland. It was brilliant. <laughs> it was brilliant. And, wow. Yeah. And that was my first Westminster. In October preceding it, I did the Irish Terrier National, which I did a couple of times, but I did the Irish Terrier National. And there were three brothers being shown. And it was one of the greatest of all times in Irish Terriers, having the three of them there, oh, plus sure. a bitch, a bitch that Bobby Clyde had. And I think she was called, she was owned by Steve Sunheimer. And I think she was called River Queen, something close to that. Beautiful bitch, beautiful coat. She's lovely. But these three dogs, and one of them was the um, Michael dog that uh, Woody had. And at Montgomery County, he won the breed. He won the breed. And, um, that bitch was the best of opposite sex. That same weekend? It couldn't have been. Roughly about that time, I was judging uh, at Montgomery County weekend, and I did some, I did Irish Terriers. I wonder what year that was. My winner's dog was Rowdy Red. <laughs> that, uh, um, that Bobby Fisher had for Ed Jenner. And the winner's bitch was the litter mate, Ginny Dare, who Bobby Milano from the West Coast had. Happened to be two litter mates. And they were both young. I think they were like nine months, maybe 10 months, and one winner's dog and one uh, winner's bitch. And I was very pleased with that. And I remember um, uh, about a month later, 
I was doing the group in Maryland, in Salisbury. And uh, the show was running late, and we had to catch a flight to go out. So I had enough time. I did my group. I wound up giving it to Rowdy Red, the Irish that Bobby had, who I thought was the best Irish I had ever seen. I said about that dog, he did not look into my eyes when I was looking into his. He looked into my soul. Yeah. He did. He makes the hair on my arm stand up today, that dog. Oh, my God, what a dog. So he won the group under me, and I was leaving, and Tom Gately was going to be doing Best in the Show. And he said to me, you're on your way? I said, I have to because I have to catch a plane. I said, I'd love to stay. He said, what did you send me? I said, I sent you a mic that I'd be interested to hear what you think of it. And that was all I said. I mean, I wasn't going to say anything past that to Tom. Let him decide. The next day, I got the New York Times Walter Fletcher, always covered. Rowdy Red won Best in Show under Tom Rather. Of course he did. Of course he did. When in a short time later, I did my first Best in Show, I had a wonderful lineup. Nothing could be Rowdy Red. Not when an Irish can look like that at you. And the beautiful planes to him. Oh, my God. He was the standard. I love that. I mean, that over the years that I judged, that happened a few times. A few times. That's I mean, incredible. Oh, yeah. When a dog comes in the ring and you see it and it is the standard, oh, my God. You can't help it. Your heart starts jumping. <laughs> it does. It does. Wow. <laughs> it happened at Great Western one year when I was doing, on Sunday, I was doing the Terrier group and I wasn't doing any breeds. I didn't see anything judged. I wasn't near, near seeing anything judged. Came time for the group. I lined them up from Airedale to Kerry and then from Lakeland to Westy. And I walked to the center of the ring and I looked, starting like down the line from Airedale down. And I'm thinking, oh, no, yeah, that's a surprise. Some of the surprises are, I wonder why that's here. <laughs> And I got to this carry, and I thought, oh, my God. And I kept this side. I didn't move them. I moved that side. And I, I said later, I had to fight the temptation, to, which was to watch the carry. Eddie Boyce said to me, you never did fight the temptation. You did watch the carry. You had to watch the carry. That was perfection. That, that Again, one of those dogs that just lights your soul and moves you. I mean, it, it emotionally moves me to see a dog like that, to have the size, balance, substance, and presence. He knew that he was better than anything I had ever seen. He knew it. And when it came time to go over him and I went over him, the last thing I did was pick him up by his tail just a small way, and I dropped him. And why? I wanted people to see that rear. On a carry. An incredible dog. Incredible dog. And I went on and did the other half too, of course, and made my cut. And he, he was my winner without question. Without question. Those, those things when they happen. Wow. One year I did uh, I did three toy breeds at the garden. I did palms, Maltese, and peaks. The palm that I gave the breed to in 1988 went on and won Best in Show. And, um, but it was the Maltese. I was Maltese. I had, we had class dogs then. I had done Winter's Dog and Winter's Bitch, and I was on specials. And I'm again looking down the line, and I come to a dog shown by a short lady with dark hair. And I thought, wow, does he look good? I have to see how he walks. I wonder if he's got teeth, and I hope his eyes aren't gold. And, and, and it came time, and he wound up on my table, and I went over him, and he was glorious. I got the finest compliment I ever got in my life. Sometimes it's hard for me to say it. <laughs> Finished judging, and I made a cut, and then I took this woman, and I said, come up here. 
And then I took a class and we put it here and I took a, a bitch and I put it here. There were no rewards of merit or anything else. And I start gating them around the ring. As I'm gating them around the ring, Frank Oberstar comes walking down the steps quickly. And I thought, hey, here's a guy who really knows this breed. This was his breed. And I point to this woman. I said, you're best to breed. You're best to winner. You're best of opposite. The woman snatches her dog off the ground. And she stands crying, crying, crying. <laughs> I tell you, my thought was, this is a dog that's never won in its life. <laughs> and, and I just pointed at it, thinking, in my mind, it's wonderful. It had a beautiful coat, beautiful size, beautiful balance, beautiful top line, beautiful texture. And it was what I wanted in the Maltese. And she said to me, I didn't have money to advertise this dog. I didn't have money to campaign him. But I, have to, I asked half the United States, and they told me you were honest that you were honest. How do you get a greater compliment? That's right. Yeah. And Oberstar came around and came in my ring and he said to me, good for you, in his voice. He said, half the country misses this dog and you found him. It was a dog called something like J.C. Lollipop. And the woman's name was Mary Day. You know, it's one of those moments where a dog fills your eye. And you have no questions. There are no questions. Uh, you know, I don't know that I'm going with this where you want me to be. Oh, it's wonderful, Ken. Your passion is unbelievable. <laughs> well, it's the way I judged. Yeah. I... Uh, I judged to be because I wanted to. And here's what I said. Just let me judge the dogs. I don't want to know anything else. I don't want to know who owns them. I want to know who handles them. I don't want to know about a campaign. I don't want to know about their standings. Of course, they don't matter. What matters is what I think. You know, here's what I did. Whenever I was going to get a breed, I read the history of the breed. Where was it formed and of what? And who owned it? And what did it look like? And what was its purpose? And let me have the standard. Let me see how the standard allows it to reach that level that they're hoping for, especially with things that work like terriers. Let me see how the standard works so that this dog can perform when it's supposed to perform. And when it's in the ring, if I'm going over the dog and it can't perform its function, it can't win. It can't win. You can't, cannot win. You're, they're, they're being bred for a purpose, and they must meet that purpose. Otherwise, they're quite useless, certainly in a breeding program. And I've, I've told people an honest thing. I was going over an Australian terrier one day, and as I'm going over it, a woman felt, felt obligate, obligated to say to me, this one's imported. And I said, hmm. And I kept going over it, and she said, this one's imported. And I said, why? And I kept going over it, and she said, this one's imported. And I said, why? And then uh, we finished, and she came back to my ring. She said, why did you keep asking me why? I said, why would you import this dog when we've got much better in this country? This dog wasn't worth bringing over. I mean, I told her the truth. Yeah. Why waste your time and money thinking that it's good when it's not? Uh -huh. I guess there's only so much that you can say in the ring. I do know that when I started judging, um, Bill Schmick interviewed me on my first day. He said, you know, and and do this and be conscious of this and be conscious and do not talk to the exhibitors. I said, you better start writing. He said, what do you mean? I said, you better start writing that I'm in offense. I said, because I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to talk to the dog. And if I've known these people for X years, if you think I'm not going to say hello or how are you, something like that, that's crazy. This is a sport. We're supposed to be enjoying it. He said, well, you're not allowed to do it. I said, I, I know that. And that's what you need to tell me. And I need to tell you, you better start writing. 
Okay, my next question is advice to new judges. I don't don't think I have to ask that question. <laughs> Who wants to get advice? Would I give a judge? Well, that judge was the next the question, dog. but I think you've already answered all those questions. Judge the dog. Yeah. Judge the dog. Get all the information that you can get on the breed and apply the standard and judge the dog. That's it. It's so easy. It honestly is easy. It is. <laughs> oh, Ken, I'm so glad we did this. <laughs> I'm glad that you're glad. I know that you've been asking me to do it, and I've been saying, why? Why, why, why? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just Ken, honest. That's, that's, that's all that I am. If people think otherwise, God bless them. Well, they do, Ken. <laughs> and this is this is going to be everything we hope for. So, <laughs> I can't believe that you kept telling me, "Oh no, I have nothing to say." I have nothing to say. That was amazing. I had the best time. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I, I, it came out smoothly. I just. I tell you my truth. I do. I, I have uh, one more question for you, though. Yes, I have sir. one question. Because I don't have to ask you any questions because you answered them all for me, except for this one. If you were to meet the 20-year-old Ken McDermott right now, is there any advice you'd give Ken? You could add some breeds that you'd like and ask the Kennel Club to give you the license to judge them. Uh, you know, a uh, funny thing, back in some year, I think 2006, 2007, I was nominated as one of five judges for Judge of the Year Kennel Review magazine. That surprised me. Well, that surprised me. I mean, these people were judging all over the world. And they were well known. And when I looked at it, I thought, oh, yeah, interesting, interesting, interesting. And somebody won it. And the following year, I was nominated again as judge of the year. And I thought, that's very kind of them. But that's very kind of them. But I'm limited. You've got some wonderful judges. And there were wonderful all breed judges. There were. So I judged a pug specialty that day in New Jersey, you know, the day before the garden. And that, that night they had the banquet, uh, the awards thing, and I didn't go. I didn't plan to go. I had, I was coming home because I judged the Pope's specialty, and that was it. That's what I was doing. I came home, and I was sitting <laughs> sitting in my bedroom watching television, and my phone rang. And there's a voice, and it's Peggy Beisel McElwain. She said, Ken, you won. You won. And I'm looking at <laughs> my answering machine saying, what is she talking about? And there must have been something that I won. I must have won a ticket or something. I won something. And I didn't pick it up. I, I was tired. And she said, you won the award for Judge of the Year. And Harry Smith is sitting here with me. And he says, congratulations, Ken. <laughs> when I went to the garden the next day, or two days later, whichever day I went in, Bill Shelton introduces me to a woman who I don't know who it was, and he says to her, this is Ken McDermott, who just won Judge of the Year. <laughs> and I just smiled, and he said to her, and he only judges two groups. That made an impact. And I thought, holy Hannah, that is true. I just won Judge of the Year, and I only judge two groups. How is that possible? They never told me how the fix happened. They didn't tell me. <laughs> what an honor. What an honor. What an yeah. honor. So I would have said to Ken, maybe there are a couple of other breeds you would have wanted to judge. Yeah, maybe so. But I don't know. <laughs> but I'm definitely retired now. Last June, I judged Best in Show. My friend Gail Bontecu was um, the show chairman, and she wanted me to judge Best in Show at her show. So she had me judge Best in Show at her show, and that was my final assignment. Well, incredible, Ken. 
You amaze me. You're, you're, just, you're the most modest man I've met, and you're just, you just, you're, you're amazing. So, and a lesson for everybody today. It's I can't wait for people to listen to this. Took me to places that I never would have been, and I went bird watching there also. <laughs> Oh, we always enjoyed you when you came up here. So <laughs> I love Canada. I mean, I loved Canada. Joan and I went there to Montreal on our honeymoon and loved can always loved Canada. And I love to judge the shows. I did, because often you had breeds that we had not seen yet and didn't know existed, like the Irish red and white setter. I never saw one until I was in Canada. Oh my goodness, you were I thought you were light years ahead of us. <laughs> And you're a great guy. You are a great guy. Always been a good sportsman. You've shown to me over the years, and you've won when you should have, and you didn't win when you shouldn't. <laughs> well, I always enjoyed showing to you. There's no question. If I saw you on the panel, I couldn't wait to get there. So, thank you. So, uh, thank you so much, Ken, for doing this for us. Uh, the, I really appreciate it, and, and I'm I can't wait for it to get out there. People are going to love seeing you. Hmm. So, amazing. <laughs> You kill me. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll let you get back to your day, Ken. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Well, wasn't that great? I told you that would be great. I told you it was worth the wait to finally get Ken to sit down and talk to us. But it was great. And thank you, Ken. If you like what you're seeing here, press the like, share, and subscribe button. If you want to get a hold of me or find out what's happening in Will's world, go to willalexandersdogshowtips.com. Till next time, guys. Talk to you soon. <laughs>